going to ask all the children, if they would, to come on up at this time. You guys can come up here. Come on up this way, guys. Everybody, come on over this way. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good, good. We'll let everybody go ahead and get settled. I um, need to ask you something this morning. How many of you have ever been tempted to do anything uh, that was wrong? Can you handle that microphone, Don? Thank you. Thank you. How many, body, how many people have ever been tempted to do something that was wrong? Do you know what tempted means? That means somebody told you to do something and you did it, but you weren't supposed to. Has anybody here ever done something wrong? Have you ever done something you knew God wouldn't want you to do? Raise your hand. Yeah, all of us can be honest. That's sin. So I'm going to give you an example. This is how this happens. I want to talk to you about temptation, okay? Now, but I need a couple of volunteers. Who wants to volunteer? Okay, Olivia, that's good. Who else wants to volunteer? Who else? All right, Ada, you can volunteer. All right, Olivia, uh, stand up for me, please. All right, Olivia, I'm going to offer you a pack of gummies. If you want to take them, you can have them right now if you want to take them. Okay? I just want to let you know that since you took those gummies, um, and maybe I should have told you this to begin with, but since you took those gummies, I will not be able to ever give you another pack of gummies again. So, I hope you enjoy that one pack because, um, like I said, by you taking it, you, you basically give up the rest of what I was going to give to you every week, all the time. Um, and, and I guess I just want to ask you, if you would have known that you were giving up all the rest of, of the gummies I was going to give you, would you have taken that pack? No. Well... That's, that's what you got, so have a seat, okay? <laughs> Ada, Ada, can you come here, son, honey? All right, so Ada, would you like to have a pack of gummies? No. <laughs> come here, honey. Listen, here's the difference. Ada, why didn't you want a pack of gummies? Because I want more every week. You want more every week. Now, listen, <laughs> all of you would have, would have done that, right? So was I really fair to Olivia? Now, basically, I lied to her by not telling her the truth, right? Uh, and that's what we do. So when somebody doesn't tell you the whole truth, is it a lie? Yeah. yeah. Guess what? Here's what I want to show you because you'll, you'll really be able to relate to this. The devil does that to us all the time. He will tempt you. He will tell you what you need to do, but he won't tell you what you're going to lose. Right. Have you ever done something that your parents told you not to do? And you just wanted to do it, right? And so there's this thing that comes in your mind that says, do it anyway. Do it because you want to do it. And so that's the devil telling you. But guess what he doesn't tell you? He doesn't tell you that you're going to be in trouble. He doesn't tell you that you're going to break your parents' heart. He doesn't tell you that you're, that you're sinning against God. He doesn't tell you all these things. He's only going to tell you one thing. But do you know that when you accept the Lord Jesus as your Savior, then he puts something inside of you. Jesus comes inside of you. We call it the Holy Spirit. And it will always tell you both things. Amen. It will tell you that if you do it, here's what you're going to lose also. So it won't ever just tell you do it. It'll give you, it'll give you advice to tell you don't take it. It will tell you the rest of the story, like what I told Ada. And it will help you make decisions. This is what you need to do. But listen, there's a lot of old people that are out here. And they've gotten saved. They've accepted the Lord as their Savior. But do you know that you won't hear that voice of the Spirit if you don't stay close to God? You won't hear it as clear. You'll just think, hey, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. So that'll help you be able to, to battle temptation when the devil is speaking if you have the Holy Spirit telling you the whole, the whole story, what you have to give up. The devil will only tell you what you can get. But God will always tell you what you can get, but what you have to give up. Now, wouldn't you rather know the whole story? If you only know half the story, then the devil will lie to you. He will always lie to you. The Bible tells you that he's a liar. And so you can't just listen to what, and you won't even hear the devil's voice. It'll just be what you want. You always have to think, what am I going to give up to do what I want to do? Okay? All right, Olivia. Now, that's an act of grace. I'm going to give you another chance. That's what God does us too. So, 
thank you for helping me, but you'll get gummies every single week, okay? Now, do you know what I just did? I did what God does to us. If we do mess up and we don't listen to his voice and we listen to just what the devil tells us and then we realize it, God gives us an, a, an opportunity to have a second chance, you know? I've used a lot of second chances and these people have too. So God loves you. He's awesome. But you need to listen to him, not listen to the voice of the devil, okay? All right, let's pray. God, I love you and I praise you and I thank you for these children. I pray, God, that as they begin to grow, as they begin to realize they need a Savior, I pray, God, that you would just draw them to you, that you would knock upon their heart's door. And then, Lord, let them hear your voice so clearly to lead them in the direction they need to be. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Who wants gummies? All right, here you go. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're you're welcome. You're welcome. Jackson, will you grab that one? There you go. You can have it. You're welcome. You're welcome. Here you go, Nolan. You sang really good. You're welcome. You're welcome. How many people have your Bible today? If you have your Bible, stand up and hold it above your head and bear witness of God's Word. Beautiful. Keep it, keep it held up. Today, we're going to have an, op an opportunity to use the Word of God. This is an opportunity afforded to you by God, the freedom that we have to be able to open this book, to read this book, to understand this book, is a God-given right. There are people in places today that don't have this opportunity, so we need to praise God and take advantage of this, because understand, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word if we neglect the word, if we start to just read what someone has wrote in this place or in that place and we leave out God's word or we alter God's word, we'll get man's word, not God's word. So this is what we'll be using today. Amen? You may be seated. Turn, if you would, please, to the book of Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. In preparing for today's message, I realized something in studying. There was a way that I could have used my entire life as a Christian to be able to help me stay in close fellowship with God. Anybody interested? So many times I can tell you, and I know that you can relate, there have been times in my life when I've had the opportunities God's given me, and even as a Christian, I haven't taken those opportunities. He teaches us in his word how to stay close to him. And today, my prayer is that as we look through his word, we'll understand the one thing that keeps us from being in fellowship with him. Do you know what stands between us and God? Does anybody know? Sin. God is a holy and righteous God. He can have nothing to do with sin. Unfortunately, you and I, are sinners. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible goes on to tell us in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Realizing that none of us are perfect, that all of us have sinned, that we're born with this sin nature that we get from Adam, understand there's something between us and God. God is a holy and righteous God, has nothing to do with sin, can't have nothing to do with sin, so I need to be able to get my sin from between me and God in order for me to have fellowship with God. There's only one way to get my sin removed from between me and God, and that is to accept the gift of God, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus was a man that lived on this earth, born of a woman, that never sinned. So, in order for me to get in fellowship with God, I have to accept that Jesus Christ took his sinless life. He sacrificed that life by dying on a cross as a blood sacrifice. He was buried. He rose again. 
for me to have my sins forgiven, I not only have to believe that that happened, it can't just be a historical belief. I have to accept it. I have to own it. And I have to ask him to use it for me. There's a lot of people that say, I believe in God, or I believe that Jesus died. But understand, it's the difference in believing in something and believing on something to use it for you. At the moment that I believe on Jesus Christ, he takes my sins, he puts my sins, as the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west. Praise God. Though my sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Do I deserve that? No. Do you deserve that? No. But at the time I do that and have my sins removed, now understand, you can't come into fellowship with God until you, until you do that. The Bible says, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. At that moment, I become a perfect individual and I never sin again. No? No? No, it hadn't happened that way with me. What about you? The devil still will tempt me to sin. Why? Because my sin will come in between me and God. And if it comes in between me and God, then I lose my fellowship back and forth between me and God. So I want to start by asking you a couple of questions. And I want to be able to look into this subject of us being in fellowship. So if you're listening today, if you're here, you're listening, understand that if you've never accepted the gift of God, which is Jesus Christ. That he loves you. That he wants you to accept that gift. But you can only come into his presence if you use Jesus in your belief, in your acceptance, and in your confession to be your Savior. To let him remove that sin. And if you have done that, understand that the devil's still going to tempt you to sin, but there is a way to overcome that temptation. What is sin? Sin is disobedience to God. Doing something against God's word. And why do we sin? Basically, we sin because we want to do what we want to do. We sin because we want to get something. Every sin that you have ever sinned, that I have ever sinned, is because we wanted something. You say, well, just because we want something, does that make it sin? No, it's when we want something that God says we're not supposed to have. It's when we want to do something that God tells us we're not supposed to do. It's when we want to not do something that God tells us we should do. Anytime we go against God, God's word, it's called sin. Why do we sin? Because we want our will more than we want God's will. Plain and simple. We sin because... We're tempted by our own thought, by our own minds, or by our flesh. We need to realize this. No sin happens without temptation. There has never been a time that sin has come in between me and God that I wasn't tempted to sin. I don't just come up with it on my own. I'm tempted by my fleshly nature or by my mind to sin. Adam and Eve, if you go back to the beginning, Adam and Eve, what did they want? They wanted the fruit. What did God tell them they couldn't have? The fruit, just on one tree, but they wanted it. And then when they were able to see that it was pleasing, for, pleasing to the eye and good for food, what did they get? They got the fruit. We don't talk about that, do we? Think about it. We always say, hey, listen, Adam and Eve, they went and sin came in the world, but what did they get to enjoy while they were sinning? That fruit, didn't they? They were able to eat that good fruit. It was so pleasing. And then it was gone. Do you know what we failed to do? And this is the way God had led me because I began to think about this and I thought, I wish I would have used this to battle sin the last 30 years that I've been a Christian. The last 40 years I've been a Christian. I wish I would have used this, but you know, sometimes that desire to sin happens so fast, doesn't it? Does yours and you know what I think about? The same thing you think about. What I want. What I want to get. What I fail to think about is what I give up. You see, you never hear any mention of Eve telling Adam what they were going to give up or Adam telling Eve. But mainly you never hear Satan because he's the one that tempted 
He told them what they were going to get, but he never mentioned what they were going to give up. Would that be a lie? That's a half truth. That's saying you're going to get this, but never considering what you're going to give up. I think about King David, knowing that as he looked out and he saw Bathsheba, you read this in 2 Samuel, he knew what he wanted to get. He saw her and he saw that, he was, he, that, that she was beautiful and he thought about what he wanted to get and he acted upon that urge and then he tried to cover that sin up and he planned the murder of her husband and all those things were spontaneous. You know what? He was always focused on what he wanted to get but if you read his story, you'll see what he had to give up. He gave up his fellowship with God. He gave up the life of his son. He gave up uh, his family closeness. And if you read Psalms 51, sometimes you'll see his repentance when he cries out to God and he talks about, God, I just want your fellowship again. All through the Bible, we see people acted upon sin, but we don't have to look at the Bible to realize our own sin. In James chapter 1, verse 14, we're told that every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now lust here, and we might say lust a couple of times today, lust here is not implying just a, a sexually immoral lust. We hear that word and we, think it, we always think it has a sexual connotation. Lust just means what we want. Now all of us can relate to that because all of us in here want what we want. That's why we don't drive up to restaurants and they say, here's your food. They give us time to what? order we order what we want and do you know that we're accustomed to that we order through life what we want all of our disagreements with somebody else is because we're not getting what we want we want to impose our will we're made that way so understand every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed you are tempted i am tempted when i see something that i want or i think something that i want whether to do it or to feel it it's one thing to be tempted to sin. It's another thing to give in to temptation. If you were to sit here and say today, I can't believe the pastor is telling me that he is tempted to sin, then you're going to have a hard time understanding in a couple of minutes that even Jesus was tempted to sin. And you're really going to have a, a hard time understanding that you yourself, which we need to admit, are tempted to sin. Any person that accepts temptation and gives into it has to give up something in order to get what they're tempted with. This is the overwhelming thought I want you to understand today. I want you to think. Think now. Has there ever been something you've been tempted with that, you haven't, that, that was sin that you haven't had to give up something for? And I believe if we would let the Holy Spirit impress this upon our mind, it would help us before we give in to that temptation. You see, my problem is not after I sin because I'm convicted by the Holy Spirit and I come and I repent for it. What I want help with, what I need help with is before I sin. What about you? Do you realize if we can get help before we sin, then we can stay in that fellowship with God and not have separation from God? Do you realize how great, what peace, what blessing, what favor if we can stay in fellowship with God? It's almost as if we accept, yes, we're going to sin, so here I am asking for forgiveness again. When we're tempted to lie, we have to give up the truth. When we're tempted to be unfaithful, we have to give up faithfulness. And when we're tempted to hate, we have to give up love. When we're tempted to anger or wrath or violence, we have to give up peace or self-control. I could go on and on. When we're tempted to cheat, we have to give up honesty. When we're tempted to worry, we have to give up confidence. When we're tempted to fear, we have to give up assurance. When we're tempted to commit sexual immorality, we have to give up purity. In all these things, when we're tempted to sin and we give into it, we give up fellowship with God. You say, well, you're saying that when I sin, that, that I give up my salvation. No, I'm saying when you sin, you give up your fellowship with God. Jesus saved you by his precious blood. The Bible tells us that we don't have to crucify him again. But we sure can break his heart. This is the way God would say it, as he said in Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, 
But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages, does everyone understand wages? I'm sure you do. Wages are what we get for what we do. Wages are what we get for what we do. Wages are what? Tell me again. Does everybody accept that definition? Wages are what we get. Now, does everyone expect wages? Sure we do. We expect to get for what we do. So the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. Stating to us that if we continue to stay in the state of sin, if we never ask the Lord Jesus to forgive us of our sins, if we never use our belief and own that belief and ask him to use that sacrifice to forgive our sins, if we stay in sin, the wages, what we get for what we do is death. Does it mean physical death? No. It means eternal death. A real hell. You say, can you say hell? Absolutely. Hell's a real place. We want to be able to talk about the hell that, that God talks about. Understand, we talk about hell and we think about hell as just the burning lake of fire, just the, the place of torment. Hell is separation from God. Not just the physical part. Hell is separation from God. The wages of staying in sin is eternal death. That means hell. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I want you to notice something here just in what we read. When God gives us something, he gives us both sides of the truth. If you stay in sin, you will get what? Tell me, what will you get? Death, Death which is what? Separation from God, which is what? What's the Bible call it? Hell. Hell. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. The devil would never give you what you're going to give up. He's only and always just given what you're going to get. Is that a lie? Yes, it's a half-truth. A half-truth is always a lie. Now, when we're tempted to sin and we give in to that sin, we're, we're giving up our obedience to God, our fellowship with God, our blessings from God. We're tempted by the devil in, in so many ways. He, he doesn't really care which of these ways we give in to. His sole purpose is to break our fellowship with God. You might say, yeah, the devil really wants me to get back on drugs. No, he doesn't care whether you get back on drugs. There are people that are convinced, well, yeah, that's what he's trying. No, he just wants you to break fellowship with God. The devil really wants me to do this. The devil doesn't care how you sin. He just wants to break fellowship between you and God. Because when you have sin between you and God, you're not in fellowship with God. In Matthew chapter 4, we read that Jesus was tempted by Satan. Here's what I want you to understand. If Jesus would have given in to any of these temptations... He would have given up his fellowship with God. Before we begin to read, understand something. The devil lies to us when he tempts us to sin. And how does he lie to us? By painting a picture of something that we think we want. But he never shows us what we have to give up. I want you to keep that thought in your mind. He shows us a picture of what we want and how we can get it. But he never shows us what we have to give up. We actually help him in these ways because as you know and as I know and I've done this myself and I, I hear a lot of it nowadays, I hear reasons why we sin. I did this but here's why. And when you're saying why you sinned, why you had to sin, you're basically redrawing the picture that the devil painted you because that's what he used to convince us to do it in the first place. Does that make sense? Listen to Matthew 4 as Jesus was tempted. Then was Jesus led up the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards and hungered. And when the tempter, hold on a second, when the tempter, what was the devil called here? When the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made into bread. 
But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into a holy city, and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said unto him, This is the second temptation, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. So the first temptation, Jesus was hungry, he had fasted, the devil appealed to his hunger, his physical hunger, and he said, turn these stones into bread, use your own power and do this. The second temptation, he took Jesus up and he said, Jesus, listen, prove that you're the son of God, cast yourself off of here, and you know that God will save you. Do something, be in control of your situation, and make God have to save you. And then Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it's written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only thou shalt serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. The third temptation The devil took Jesus up to this highest point, let him look out over the beautiful kingdoms, let him look out over the mountains and the cities and let him see everything and said, Jesus, I will give all of this to you right now if you will bow down and worship me. Understanding these three temptations, this is important to know, something that we see in the very first verse. Jesus was led by the Spirit. Don't forget that. As he went to be tempted, he was led by the Spirit. We know that God is in three persons. There is Father God, God, the God of creation, the God that sits on his throne, the God that made us, the God that loves us, the God that you've never seen, that no one has ever seen. And then there's the manifestation of God, Jesus Christ, who was born of a woman, who walked and lived and breathed on this earth, who died for our sins. We have God the Father, we have God the Son, and then we have God the Holy Spirit the third person of God. We'll learn about the strength of that spirit today, but Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. If you read Luke chapter 4, verse 1, you will see that in Luke chapter 4, it tells us Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness. So he had help as he was tempted from the devil. We'll see how we can use this same help. And this is very important to know. If you're a Christian, if you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then there is no temptation that you cannot overcome. Did you hear that? That's the best news you should have heard today. Because if sin separates you from God and you really care about it, and you know that you're going to get tempted, understand something. There is no temptation that you cannot overcome. There's never a time where you can say, I couldn't help it. Never a time. You say, but we say that all the time. Yes, we do. We even convince ourselves. We believe the devil's half-truth so much that we believe we didn't have a choice. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there is no temptation taking you but such is common to man, but God is faithful. God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you're able to bear, but will with that temptation also provide for you, make for you a way to escape. He'll never have you in a spot you can't get out of. It's amazing that Jesus actually describes this working of the Holy Spirit. So understand something, as we stated before, when you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Spirit of God moves into you. The Spirit of God. It strengthens you. It guides you. Listen, as Jesus spoke in John 16, let me tell you how he described the Holy Spirit. He tells us that the Holy Spirit is just like him living inside of us, guiding us, leading us, and advising us. Jesus states in John 16, 13, 14, he says, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into, now this is important, all truth. What did he say? Half truth? all truth. And then verse 14 says, it tells us the Spirit will glorify or represent Jesus himself by showing you what the actual truth really is. This is the work of the Holy Spirit to show us what the truth really is. 
There are times when we believe what we want to believe. We act outside of the will of God because it's really what we want to do. We actually would even say that the more I thought about it, the more I convinced myself this is what I needed to do. That is the part truth. Do you know what we never realize or or what takes a, a long time for us to realize? What we had to give up to do that. Now let me just get real with you a minute. You see, we need to be reminded of what the truth is because in our flesh nature, sometimes we choose to put the truth away. We don't realize it until it's too late. You say, what are you talking about? Hey, listen, I've been in that situation before, even as a Christian, knowing what the truth of God's word said, what I was supposed to do and not supposed to do. And I can remember how appealing it was as a young man thinking, I want to do this, but I know I've been taught, I know the Bible says, and I have this nervous feeling that I shouldn't do it, but I know it's going to feel good, I know it sounds good, I know I wanted to do it, it is my desire, it's my desire, it's what I want. Everybody else is doing it, I want to do it too, I want to get this part. Has anybody ever been petitioned by the devil in that overwhelming thing? You need to do it, even though you know it's wrong, you need to do it. Anybody been in that position? Thank you for being honest, right? And it was overwhelming. And so here's the thing. Ashamedly, I sinned. And I can remember a time when I was 17 years old. And I stood in front of my parents with my head bowed, upset, in trouble, with my parents crying because I'd broken their heart. And then it was easy to see what I had given up. I'd given up the trust they had. I'd given up their fellowship. I'd given up this relationship I had with them. I'd given up all those things. But why didn't I see that when I was was just looking to say, I want to do this, I want to do this? Why didn't I see that? Because I was only seeing the half truth. The Holy Spirit would have guided me in whole truth. But there's something that happened because when I was 16, even all those things I knew, I I began to to break fellowship with God. I let little sin turn into bigger sin to turn into bigger sin. And then before long, you know, you say, well, weren't you going to church? I thought your parents made you go to church. I went to church and I didn't listen. I tuned it out. You can sit right here today and you can tune it out. You can tune it out. My goal is not to have you go to sleep. I want to keep it exciting. I don't think church should be boring, right? But if I can keep you awake, then it's up to you to listen. Now, listen. We will convince ourselves of what we want without thinking of what we have to give up. I have sat on this side of counselings with people who are crying. They know they've done wrong in their marriage. And now they're at a spot to where they've lost someone that truly, truly loved them. They have no idea what they're going to do. Not only have they lost somebody that loved them, they lost the, the children they had between them. They've lost these things in life that really were their fulfillment. But none of those thoughts came at the time of temptation. It was just an innocent text it was just some emails it was just a post on Facebook I responded back to then it became something else and and I was just fine I had a reason to do this but never did they consider what they would have to give up if I can get myself to the point before sin of thinking what I have to give up do you know that it will help me be able to battle the temptation you say Why do we need to hear that? Do you realize as a church body, if you can stay in fellowship with God, the strength of this church body, the strength of you individually? Get this. As Christians, 
we do have the power to overcome this temptation, which is a, a lie from the devil, and, and hear the voice of Jesus speak to our heart and our mind. We have this ability to hear the Holy Spirit speak, but we won't do it. We won't hear it if we keep separating ourselves. You'll be just like I was when I decided to distance myself. It wasn't that I just woke up one day and said, I'm going to stop going to church. No. It stopped little by little, by little by little. I missed the little. Then I missed more. Then I missed more. Then I wasn't reading the word. I wasn't listening to somebody read the word. I wasn't praying. I wasn't doing these things. So my fellowship, the way that I was close to God, the way I could hear God. And if I'm not hearing God, who am I hearing? I'm hearing the devil. He's going to be consistent to tempt me on a daily basis. He's going to be consistent to tempt you. But praise God, we have help. We have help as a Christian through the Holy Spirit. If you've accepted the Lord as your Savior, I'm speaking to Christians now, you have help. Listen to this, this verse. Listen to this straightforward, simple verse, Hebrews 2.18. Speaking of Jesus. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to help them that are tempted to secure them that are tempted, to help them that are tempted. He was tempted so he can help us. So what does that mean for me? That means in, in this part, on this side of heaven, I am able as a Christian to know that I have help. I'm not going into this day all alone. That is a great thing. And then I read in Hebrews 4, 15, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with feelings of our infirmities, but within all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. These two verses are important, and I'll tell you why. Because Jesus tells us on two realms here, and you really need to understand this, before you're tempted, you have the op opportunity, the availability, to stay in fellowship with God, to stay close with him and his word, to hear the preaching of his word, the teaching of his word. You say, you don't understand my schedule. Well, I guess you just slipped between what God was saying. I guess it applies to everybody but me or you, right? Wrong. If you want to worship God, if you want to use your time to put forth toward God, God will give you other time. Has anybody ever experienced that? He'll reward your faithfulness. But here's what happens. He tells us in Hebrews, I've been tempted before. I can help you when you're tempted. We're going to see that Jesus was tempted. He offers us help through the Holy Spirit. But let's just say we fail. Has anybody ever failed when they were tempted? Of course we have. Then he says, I am Jesus also, the high priest. And I've been tempted before. So when Mike fails in his temptation, here's what he's saying. The high priest was always the one that went into the presence of God. Do you realize that when you sin and you ask God to forgive you, you go through Jesus because he's the one that forgave your sins. That's why we pray in Jesus' name. When I pray, I'm praying to God. The Holy Spirit makes intercession, intercessory uh, prayer for me to Jesus Christ. Where does Jesus Christ sit? On the right hand of God the Father. When Jesus goes to the Father, he has to say, Mike has sinned. And he's coming asking for forgiveness. But understand, he's the high priest who suffered being tempted before. So he is able to say, I know, Father, I've been a man before. I know that he's tempted by this. So I know what the urge, the temptation is. Now he's coming and he's asking for forgiveness. So he goes on our behalf. Isn't that wonderful? He doesn't go as someone who never was tempted. He goes as someone who is tempted. So understand that we have availability to God through Jesus Christ because he was tempted. But understand this. In this story that we're given of Jesus' temptation, Jesus would have had to give up his obedience to God. He would have had to give up his fellowship with God. He would have had to give up God's plan in order to do what he wanted to do. What we need to know is that every person is going to be tempted. Every person. Every Christian is going to be tempted to do something wrong that God's told us not to do. The devil even is called the tempter. Now, when you hear us talking about sin in church, 
Sometimes we have this tendency to tune it out, and the devil will help you tune it out. I realize that. He didn't want this message preached. I had major struggles getting to church this morning. I get up extra early so I can get to church and, and have my mind cleared. You know, the devil gave me extreme troubles this morning getting to church. I had equipment problems getting to church. Uh, my glasses popped out for crying out loud. <laughs> and in fixing them, they're all bent to pieces. I can't even, I had contacts in, contacts out, readers on, readers out. Couldn't get anything. Finally, they got fixed at the last minute. I think fixed until in the morning when I can get there. I know the devil doesn't want us to hear. And, and even in you, he's going to try to convince you, hey, it's about sin. It's about sin. You're fine with that. You know what sin is? It's simple. But no, that's our struggle. That's our problem. We can't, we can't have the fellowship that God wants us to have as long as we minimize sin. But we don't need to just count on the grace of God to give us forgiveness afterwards. We need to be able to stop it before it happens, like Jesus did. When Jesus was tempted in all these ways, he responded to the devil in certain ways that I don't think I ever noticed before, but now it seems to be so clear. And I think even since God had impressed it upon my mind, I've used it in these recent days to be able to help me battle any temptation. And I think if we can see this today, it can help each and every one of us in our everyday temptation and how we respond to it. Understand something. The devil tempts us by only showing us that we, what we can get, not what we have to lose. And in these past several days, as this message has hit my heart, there is a process that I'm listening to the Holy Spirit, and he's showing me what I have to lose if I do or act upon this thought. Wouldn't it be great to have that be automatic? When Jesus was tempted in all these ways, he responded the right way. The devil offered Jesus something in all three of these different temptations. And I want to go through these three temptations briefly. We could talk about them for months. But I want you to consider the first temptation. He said, Jesus, you're hungry. You have a fleshly need. You have a desire. Anybody in here ever been hungry? Right? Are you that person that needs a Snickers when you're hungry? I know people that turn into monsters when they're hungry. Do you? You know that person? Quit looking at them. Quit looking at them. I see that, right? <laughs> Hunger's real, right? But there was more at stake here than hunger. Jesus knew that if he would have listened to this temptation, if he would have turned those stones into bread, then he would have sinned. Why? Because Jesus was in the wilderness under the leadership. Remember, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, do you think that God would let Jesus starve to death in the wilderness? And Jesus knew he wouldn't. But this was an opportunity for Jesus to do something on his own outside of the will of God. Well, that is the definition of sin. Jesus turned these stones into bread. Understand, it gets more complicated. Jesus, use your power to turn these stones into bread. Understand something. Jesus was not sent to this world to use his own power. You said, well, Jesus healed. Jesus did all these things. Jesus did them in the name of God, which he stated, so that my Father will be glorified. If he would have acted in his own power, then he would have stepped out outside of, of even Philippians 2, which tells us about Jesus. Jesus, he took on the form of a man. He humbled himself, even to death, death on the cross. Philippians 2 tells us that he didn't come here to be God, he came here to be man. He couldn't have died for our sins as God. He had to be a human being that suffered like we did with temptation in order to overcome temptation. So if he would have taken the God part of him and said, hey, stones be bread. At that moment in time, the story of Jesus would have stopped. He would have went, went, went against God's will. You know what he said? Hey, Satan, let me give you some scripture. 
He starts by saying, as it is written. Can I translate this? Hey, God said. As it is written means God said. God said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Do you know what he was saying? He was going back to Deuteronomy and quoting a verse that came from a situation. And I don't want to get too far off track, but the situation he was quoting from, this is what's important. The situation was that the children of Israel didn't trust God. They trusted in themselves. So God said, they're going to get hungry. They're going to get hungry. Then I'm going to send manna from heaven. And then after I feed them and they see that the only provision can really come from me and that I'm God and they're not in control, then I'm going to tell them you can't live by bread alone. That's what he was trying to tell Satan. I'm not calling the shots here, Satan. My father will feed me. I'm not going to sin. Amen? The next temptation that Jesus faced was in verses 5 through 7. The devil tempted Jesus to put, put God to the test by throwing himself off the highest pinnacle of the temple and cause God to have to act by sending his angels to rescue Jesus. And then the devil used scripture in Psalms 91 and misquoted it. Just like a liar would. He twisted the scriptures. You can turn on your TV or radio and hear there's a lot of liars out there today twisting scriptures. This scripture was given to him. Understand. This scripture was about trusting that God would protect. And the devil was using this scripture as a way to tempt Jesus to put God to a test by saying or, or telling him to do something that he decided to do without God's approval. Would God have had him do this? No. If God wanted Jesus to do it, then he would have told Jesus to do it. He took his commands from God and God only. The devil said, cast yourself off of this highest peak. And if you are the son of God, then God will send his angels to swoop down and, and carry you up so that you won't dash your foot against the stone. Here's some scripture to go with it. That'll justify why you need to do it. But notice what Jesus said again. And I love the way he starts. Hey, as it is written. God said. He's saying, God said. Read it with me, verses 5 through 7. Then the devil taketh them up into the holy city and set them on the pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee concerning thee, and their hands shall, shall bear thee up, lest ye dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus said unto him, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Why is this important? Very important. The scripture was about trusting that God would protect them. The devil used it, twisted it around, and if Jesus would have given in to that temptation, at that moment, the story of Jesus would have stopped. He would have sinned and given up his ability to die for our sins as the only man that could ever sacrifice his sinless life for ours. He would have been imposing his own will and forcing God to react to save him. If Jesus would have cast himself out, he would have said, God, we're going to my plan now. I'm going to impose my will. I'm going to cast myself out so that you have to save me. That's called tempting God. You say, I can't believe the devil would want him to do it. I can't believe we do it. We tempt God all the time with our sin. God, I know I'm yours, but I'm in a bind. I'm going to do this and I'm going to ask for forgiveness instead of permission. I know the grace of God is big, so I'll just come back to him and I'll ask him to forgive me of my sins. I'm going to do this, God. I know it's not right, but, but listen, I'm going to make the call and you'll have to come in and rescue me. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Why? It's a sin. Jesus knew it was a sin. Jesus didn't fall to that. Praise God, he didn't sin. He quoted Deuteronomy 6.16. Jesus said, it is written again. Listen, I love the way he says, it is written again. That's why I love this translation. You look here and it tells you exactly, it is written again. He said, I've told you one time, Satan, it's written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And that's exactly what our sin is. When we go against what God has said, 
when we go against what God has said to get something that we want, we give up our fellowship with God and our peace and our blessings that we want God to give us. Do you think that that person that reacts on this desire of the flesh, do you think at that time they actually consider what they're going to give up? You know people that have been through that. The allure of stepping outside the sanctity of marriage, the covenant of marriage. Do you think at that time the thought is, let me sit down and think about everything that I have to give up? As a Christian, do you think that the person that decides, okay, I'm going to put this out here so that I can impose my will and, and God will make it work out, but I, I know I'm going I'm to take this position that's going to take me away from God or I'm going to do this thing that God's not going to be happy with, but, but God will make it all work out. Do you think that God is going to bless that action? He can't because we're tempting him. We're going against what he's saying. And Jesus said, I don't want to have any part of that. The devil was trying to tempt Jesus to call his own shots, to force God to react. He tempts us with this same thing. When we do this, here's what we do. We give up God's power when we try to pursue our own control because we think we will have the power and control. This is a lie the devil tempts us with in our own pride. You're smart enough to do this. I know that, that pastor's standing up there and he's telling you that you don't do it, but you can make your own call. You make your own call. I know the Bible says this, but listen, let me, let me find somebody that agrees with me. That's why the Bible says in the last day that people will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. People want to be told what they want to be told. They want to come, they want to worship in church, not feel like they have to change anything, leave feeling good about themselves. And listen, we're not made to do that. You might say, well, I come in here and I feel like my toes are stepped on. Listen, I preach to me before I even preach to you. You don't think I get convicted about what he's telling me to study? I need it. If I'm left to my own self, then I'll try to find something that makes me feel good that I don't have to change. We all will. The third thing the devil tempted Jesus with was in verses 8 through 10. The devil tempted him by saying, I will give you, I will give you. He took Jesus up to the top of the mountain. He led him to see all the kingdoms of the world. And he told him, I will give you all the things that you see if you will worship me. Meaning, if you'll go against God, then I'll give you the power and control of all these things in the world that look good to you. Now, what was he asking Jesus to do? This is, this is pretty neat if you think about it. The devil was using that thing that we fall into the most. Do you know when we want something that we want? You know when we want it? Now. Do you know that we're creatures that desire immediate gratification? We are. That's why the majority of the world is not saved. They want what they want to experience now. To, to hear a book that tells you about uh, the, the fellowship that you can have with God right now, but your, your real blessings are going to come later in a, in a time of heaven. And, and so I'm not one of those people that just preaches on heaven. Heaven is great. Don't get me wrong. One of the greatest things about having salvation is eternal security with God. But praise God, I do get something now. I get everyday fellowship with God. I've got a protector. I've got a provider. I've got someone that's closer than a brother. I've got someone who doesn't let me fear, doesn't let me worry because I put it in his hand. I claim his word. That's what I can have now, right? But the devil, he's working against that. He told Jesus, get this, understand the position Jesus said. Do you think Jesus knew the plan of God? Hey, Jesus, here's what you need to do. You're going to go to this world. You're going to make yourself known. You're going to Heal the sick. You're going to make the blind to see. But in the midst of drawing these crowds to you, you're going to tell them that they need to repent. They need to believe on you for their salvation. And then after that time, you're going to give yourself up. You're going to give your life, your sinless life, as a sacrifice for man. Jesus, you have to be able to appease the blood covenant. The blood covenant back in the Old Testament was the only thing that could take away sins. The lamb that was taken and the blood that was shed, that's what God instituted all the way back to the beginning. When the first animal was killed to clothe Adam and Eve, it was a blood sacrifice to cover sin. And Jesus, you're going to go down there, and what I want you to do is do my will. This is God talking to Jesus. You have to live a sinless life, and then you'll, you'll die on the cross. You'll be 
you'll be suffering, there'll be torment, there will be human beings. And I know that, that you came from me and you have power to call all these legions of angels to rescue you, but you can't. You have to suffer. You'll have to let common men come and spit in your face. They will beat the flesh off of your back. They will put a crown of thorns in your head. You will suffer, you will bleed, and you will die to represent the love I have for those men. And you will love them too. And after you do that, you'll be buried. I'll raise you on the third day. You'll spend a little time on earth and then you'll ascend to heaven. You'll sit here with me on the right hand of me and you will make intercession for all those people who believe in you. At a given time that no man knows, I will send you back to this earth to, so that the dead in Christ will be raised and all those who are alive and remain will be caught up together. I'll call all the saved up here with me. And then there'll be seven years that people will have an opportunity we'll call it the tribulation after they go through that some will come to me some won't then you'll come back not as the God of peace not as the prince of peace but you'll go back as the judge the righteous judge and you'll destroy all those and you'll set up your kingdom this millennial kingdom for a thousand years and you will reign and you will be king of kings and lord of lords and you know what the devil said Hey, you want to be king of kings and lord of lords now? You want to be king, king, lord, lord? Look, 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 look. Yeah, I want it now. I want it now. I want it now. That's the way we're geared, right? I can have it now. How many times have you failed in that application? How many times have I failed? We want what we want, and we want it now. He showed Jesus all these things and he says, you want it now? Bow down, step out of God's plan. That plan that's going to take forever. That plan that's going to have you suffer. That plan that's going to have you mock. That plan that's going to be hard. Step out of it and I'll give it to you now. That's the same thing the devil tells you. Listen, hey, listen, if you keep reading your Bible and keep going to church and keep doing what, then listen, God's favor will be on you. And sometimes in our mind, the devil will say, stop it. Just get what you want now. Stop going through this Christian thing. Praise God. Jesus didn't get tempted. Do you know how he responded? Get thee hence, Satan. Get out of here. For it is written, Thou shalt serve the Lord thy God, him only. I wouldn't dare step out of God's plan and step into yours. That's what he told Satan. Read verse 10. Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only thou shalt serve. Do you know that we fall into this on a daily basis because of these, this one thing I'm trying to get across today? We don't think about what we give up. Guys, I implore you, I not only have messed up, I've had the opportunity of crying and, and having my heart broken with people who have messed up. You don't hear that side of it. The allure to go against what God said is strong. It gives you something right now. It gives you immediate gratification or it gives you your own power or it lets you set your own agenda or it says, I'm going to run my life. But listen, we have decisions to make here and now that are based on what we have to give up. I've met with parents that are heartbroken, wanting to hear from their children, wanting to hear that they're okay, wanting them just to, to, to be back and doing godly things and, and knowing and pouring their heart out in prayer for them every single day, every single night, and, and their heart is broken. And they will tell you, at some point in life, I just wanted to get for them what they needed then. I wanted them to participate in this. I wanted to push them towards this. I wanted to do this. And yes, I could have had them in church. I could have had them under the sound of the word. I could have, I could have involved them. I could have made church more important. But now, look what I gave up. The rest of their life. We have to think about what we're giving up. It'll help us not to give in. And Jesus approached the devil in this way. And I never saw it that way. 
Never saw it that way, but that's exactly the verses he gave him. He was basically saying, I won't give up what God has for me to give in to you. Here's the scripture that goes with it. Isn't that beautiful? Because the things the devil tempts us with are the same things that John stated in 1 John 2, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It is not of the Father, but of the world, and the world passeth away. All these things that we want are temporary things. He's trying to give us something that we can have now, but something that's eternal also. You see, this is how Jesus battled this temptation from the devil. This is how he won. I want to give you the victor story. This is how he won. He battled the thought of temptation of what he could get by thinking about what he would give up. Me and you, we need to battle the thought about what we can get by having the thought of what we'll give up. You say, well, what if that thought doesn't come to me? I will guarantee you, if you choose to be close in fellowship with God, the Holy Spirit will not fail you. The Bible has told you, I will help you. You'll leave this service today if you bow before a holy and righteous God and ask him to tell you and show you what you'll give up. God said it's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He'll help you not to sin. And you say, well, it's too late for me. It's never too late. I read in that first chapter of 1 John, he says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Praise God. The Holy Spirit will always, always lead us into the truth by telling us what we have to give up, not just what we can get. The devil will always tell you the half truth. He'll just tell you what you have to get. If we agree to Satan's lie and give in to temptation, we'll always give up something to do it. All of our temptation to sin comes from the devil who God calls the tempter. The devil's lie is that we will get something we want by sinning. The truth is that we will give up something for sinning. Isn't that opposite of the way our mind works? Jesus' message to Satan is, I'm not giving up what God's promised me to sin. How we would change if we could work off of that, right? He'll speak to that person that's lost. And you might be that person today. He'll speak to that person that's lost and tell that person, come to me. It's not enough just to know that I existed. I'm not just this historical Jesus. You don't need to believe in this, this imaginary aura of God that's up here. You have to believe there's a holy and righteous God that loves you, that created you, that loves you enough that he sent his son Jesus to die for you. And if you come to him today, he'll take that sin and he'll clear it away. He'll give you fellowship with God because you can't have it without him. He says, no man comes to the Father but by me. He'll do it for you today. But as you sit and listen, the devil will tell you it's not necessary. That you can save yourself. He'll tell you that there's good works that you can do. And the Bible refutes that and says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't do it by good works. You can't be born into it. You can't join a certain church. You can't go through this class and then teach you how to be saved and just do it with a head knowledge. There has to be a time. Nothing wrong with the class, but there has to be a time you apply that and say, God, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins and save me. I believe Jesus died for me. Use his blood to cover my sins. There has to be a, a time. Jesus puts it this way. You must be born again. And when that has happened, the devil is not going to leave you alone. But you have the power to overcome any temptation by being able to have Jesus himself in the form of the Holy Spirit, as he said, help you. And how does he need to help me? He needs to, to be able to remind me what I've got to lose, not what I've got to gain. Nobody needs to tell me what I've got to gain, and I've already figured that up. Isn't that amazing the way we do it? I sit down and I talk to people and I say, hey, listen, do you know what you make every week? Yeah, here's what I make. I make this much. Boom. Do you know what you spend every week? Well, no, we don't keep up with that part. We know what we have to gain, but we don't keep up with what we have to lose by nature, right? We're the same way. 
And I'm here to declare today that I need help. And if you're honest, you would say you need help. Well, your help comes from the Lord. During this invitation time, if you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you can't say with 100% assurity that I know that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm saved, if you're doubting it, if you're in a place that says, I believed in Jesus, and I believe he existed, but I've never had that time where I've actually asked him to be my Savior and Lord, please don't wait another day. The devil right now will try to convince you what you have. I want to tell you, if you leave here today without that assurance, what you have to lose. But it won't be just me now. That flip-flop that your heart is doing, that's because the Holy Spirit's telling you what you have to lose. God wants fellowship with you. He sent his son Jesus to die for you. He loves you that much. Come today and ask Jesus to be your Savior. I'll pray right with you. None of us deserve it. I don't deserve it, but he'll do it today. And if you're a Christian today and you realize that you need help whenever you're tempted, which should be every person in this room, then come and ask God to help. Ask him to show you what you have to lose when you're tempted with what you have to gain. Because that's the way sin happens every single time. Ask the Holy Spirit to strengthen you. And if there's something in between you and God, do you realize you can remove it today? He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. None of us are perfect. None of us will remain perfect. There won't be uh, any perfect people in here until we have our glorified bodies and we're made like Jesus. Today, if you find yourself in a situation where there's something between you and God, don't think about the person watching you, sitting beside of you. Don't matter what time it is. Don't think about any of those things. Come bow before a God that loves you and accept his invitation. If you're a Christian, ask him to give you that help to battle temptation so that you can stay close to him. I absolutely guarantee you he will. His word does not lie. Thy word hath I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. How do I know that the Holy Spirit walking close to me will help me? Because Galatians 5.16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I need to walk close to the Holy Spirit. In order to do that, I need to be faithful to Him. I need to go where He's at. I need to seek Him. In order to overcome sin and to battle temptation, you have to think about what you're giving up. Think about what you're giving up. Father God, I love you, and I praise you, and I thank you. I thank you, Lord, today that you paint this picture in this story. You show us, and Lord, as I've met with so many people, as I've been in that situation myself on the other side of sin, Lord, when I've seen everything that I've lost because of my sin, when I watch hearts break and families split, when I watch, Lord, people just become destitute and, Lord, become discouraged and depressed because they never realized. The devil never told them what they had to give up, Lord. I realize we all need help. I pray, God, today that there's boldness within this congregation, boldness, Lord, from those that are listening to bow before you. Lord, pull them up and pull them to you and let them know you're willing to strengthen them and forgive them. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here that's never accepted your son Jesus as Savior, today will be that day. But, Lord, that people leave here rededicated to you in their walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen.